Welcome to the Road Dog Project. This is Don Muskies and my canine co-host, Leon. Thanks to celebrity coaches, we're hitting the road and talking to the pros that make concerts and live events happen. If you'd like to support the channel, we'd appreciate a big thumbs up, and please enjoy the episode. Today we have the honor to take a ride with Mr. Mike Golden, Vice President of Bandit Lights, Inc. Founded in 1968, Bandit is an international, full-service, concert lighting and live event production company. Before even graduating high school, Mike pursued the concert and touring industry, eventually honing his skills in concert lighting and touring the world for over a decade. Mike has now been at Bandit Lights for over 40 years. He is a cornerstone of that company and a fixture in the Nashville production community. Originally from Kingsport, Tennessee, he is Mr. Mike Golden. Mike, thanks for coming out. Don, it's an honor to be here with you. I'm, a, I'm very humbled that, oh. that you would ask me to be a part of this. Uh, and I will start by saying that my motto has always been, I'm more comfortable behind the spotlight than in front of it. Same here, same here. But, uh, you know, desperate times. <laughs> and, and normally, if we were all uh, working the way we wanted to be, uh, I probably wouldn't. Ha you, you wouldn't have time to do this, nor would I. No. So I'm very happy that you were able to do it, Mike. You're, to me, you're uh, one of the fixtures of the Nashville production community, and uh, I don't know your track record, but I'm betting that you haven't missed uh, many days of work in 40 years. It, it, can you count them? <laughs> How many days you've missed? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I really couldn't. Uh, but, you not, know, but not many. No, not many. Uh, w with my 40 years, I arguably accrue quite a lot of vacation time, uh, but I don't recall once ever taking the full allotment. Um, it's partially because I don't want to miss anything, and it's partially because I'm afraid I will miss something just by, you know, the, yeah. the period of being away. And when you are away, you're still working. Well, that, you're, that's the nature of all road people. Well, and everything gets busy the, immediately. As soon as you decide you're going to go do something, that's when everything starts blowing up. Exactly. That's the way it always works. Exactly. Uh, and uh, the, when, when I hear the title of vice president, um, to me, that usually the one that does all the work. And in terms of the office, I'm sure that's you. And from what I know and what I've dealt with with you, that's usually been the case. Um, and also, when I said there's a Nashville office, uh, office doesn't really uh, cover uh, Nashville's uh, bandit uh, empire mm -hmm. <laughs> and real estate. I want to talk about bandit, and I want to talk about the, the, the sad part of the state of affairs right now a little bit in that... Um, Tell me about, uh, so we're trying to make some awareness to other people in the industry, and we're also trying to make awareness to a lot of people that are outside the industry, don't understand what we do and why we're not back to work. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand how many people are behind the shows that we work at, mm -hmm. the, the tours that we support. Um, what is, uh, what's the normal uh, uh, employees at uh, Banda? What's the count of people that you keep employed on a regular basis when things are cruising along on a summer obviously it'll 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 fluctuate yeah. um, we have a a large core of full-time bandits uh, that have been with the company actually there's a uh, one other employee that's been with bandit longer than I have oh, wow. uh, he's still a road guy as a matter of fact um, but we employ I think north of a of hundred full-time people and that would exclude office staff yeah uh, but when you hit the, the, the heat of summer, yeah, um, you start to sort of drain your resources. Yeah, and during those periods, we will arguably uh, put two full-time bandits out with one freelance bandit as as a third, right. or, or whatever his strength may be. Right. But during the course of a year, our our uh, employee role will fluctuate rather drastically. Yeah. And so, tell me about January, February, March. What what was going on? What happened? Uh, what what you had to deal with? This was going to be. You probably hear this from a lot of people. 
this was going to be one of the most incredible years I've experienced behind the desk. Yeah. Uh, and I have been booking shows for 30 years yeah. now. Um, it, it was, this year started out, ironically, with the owner of Bandit Lights being uh, uh, recognized by the industry as a visionary. And he was asked to go to uh, Los Angeles to the Parnelli Awards um, to accept this award. This was January 18th, I do believe. Michael Strickland. Michael Strickland. Yeah. That was an incredible evening. He was not only uh, acknowledged um, by the entire industry, lighting industry, but unbeknownst to anyone, um, Garth Brooks came to personally uh, congratulate him. Even Michael didn't know. The, the, the people that were running the Parnelli Awards did not know. Wow. Garth actually called one of the mid-level people, yeah. asked if he could be snuck in through the kitchen door, wow. and he walked out to simply just you know tell the crowd what, what Michael Strickland meant to Garth. So that's how our year started. Yeah. Um, I got back from that uh, awards, honestly, to a very full plate already lined up for this year. Um, we had two or three tours already on the road, um, large tours, yeah. but we, we were lined up yeah. to, to be beyond capacity. Now, when I say beyond capacity, yeah. that, that actually is just sort of a glamorized term for we have more work than we need. Yeah, but those are the good problems. And, and that's where these freelancers suddenly come into play sure. because, you know, you, just like uh, equipment, you can buy more equipment. You, you never yeah. are out of equipment. Yeah. Uh, but but qualified personnel are a different matter altogether, as I'm sure you well know. And that, that you want to put your name on. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, um, it, you know, um, after I got back from that awards show, I went to a sold out uh, Jason Aldean concert in uh, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee at Thompson Bowling. 17,000 people were there. That would have been February the 22nd. And uh, I took my family on a vacation to Las Vegas the 8th of March through the 13th. And that is the week that the world fell apart. Yeah. So I was in Las Vegas. Still there. I yeah. was in Las Vegas. We were having a great time. Um, but literally hourly, I, were, I was getting updates yeah. that uh, Reba is now postponing, and now Brooks and Dunn is postponing. Um, Alice Cooper is now postponing. It just was yeah. just a yeah. constant flood yeah. of postponements. Um, but it was pretty obvious that this was not going to be a temporary halt. This, this was going to be a, a much longer term issue. And so what looked incredible up until march the 8th it turned into what we now see and that's just a, a desolate landscape yeah so let's talk about bandit a little bit there's a bandit is a huge empire um offices in nashville not uh, uh, founded in knoxville correct uh office in charlotte san francisco london and hong kong okay um and some of those london and hong kong uh, hong kong is an affiliation Okay. London is an office that we had for, boy, time escapes me, but over a dozen years, 14 years possibly. For a multitude of reasons, we decided it'd be best to focus on America. Do one thing and do it best. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Uh, and meanwhile, I, th I think it was one of the most intelligent things uh, Michael Strickland has done yeah. in in dissolving the UK operation. It did allow us to bring, you know, shore all of our equipment in America, yeah. the uh, the European market was just not being yeah. uh, product. Uh, you yeah. know, it, it just wasn't working. Yeah. Well, we talked about uh, Garth Brooks uh, being a, a Bandit client. Um, another longtime uh, client is Jimmy Buffett. Is he one of the longest running clients of Bandit? I would have to say so. We started doing Jimmy Buffett while I was still on the road. Um, I believe we started with Jimmy in 86. Okay. Garth would have been a 90 or 91 model. Yeah. Let's talk about when you came into here, came into this. So there's a, I saw some of the uh, stories. You're, you're out of Kingsport, Tennessee. Correct. So were you a uh, Indian or a rebel? 
I was an Indian. Oh, okay. <laughs> And uh, you mentioned Alice Cooper earlier, so he was a big inspiration in terms of you getting into production. Yeah. Um, some people get real tired of hearing this story, but I'm so proud of it. Yeah. Uh, I was in high school, and uh, my father was a surgeon, uh, a very good surgeon. And I had two albums when I was in the 10th grade, believe it or not, Simon Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water, and Billion Dollar Babies. Wow. And my dad heard me playing Billion Dollar Babies over and over and over. And believe it or not, during surgery one day, my dad somehow parlayed getting me three tickets to see Alice Cooper um, at a local coliseum in Johnson City. So I took my two best friends to that concert, uh, a fellow named Kent Schaeferman and a fellow named Steve Strickland, which is Michael's younger brother. So Alice Cooper was the very first concert I ever saw. Um, and as a 10th grader, I was drifting as most kids do. Yeah. And from that point forward, that's all I wanted to do. Um, so immediately after that concert, I sought out and landed a job working at that Coliseum. I spent four years as a stagehand, popcorn popper, floor mopper, um, you name it, spotlight operator. You name it, I did it. Did you ever? Did you ever play an instrument? No, no. <laughs> you had to think about that. You, you well, my, my, I had a guitar. I, I, I was given piano lessons, but no. <laughs> <laughs> you were given piano <laughs> lessons. <laughs> okay. So, so, so you were uh, working. This, was this Freedom Hall? Freedom Hall okay. Civic Center. So you Johnson were working Center. there. After now, and when you saw the Alice. Cooper concert, where was that? Was it at that venue? It was at that oh, venue. Wow. Welcome to my nightmare. Okay. So uh, you're working there doing anything and everything mm -hmm. and running Spotlight? At, for $2.41 an hour because wow. it was a city owned uh, venue. But yeah, we would show up every day that I wasn't in college because uh, I was going to ETSU at the times. Actually, half the time I was in Knoxville going to uh, UT, but I would drive home every weekend to do the shows. But um, we would start a week by popping X amount of bags of popcorn, literally 50 garbage bags of popcorn. That might be Monday. On Tuesday, we might make four or 500 hot dogs, freeze them. Yeah, yeah. Wednesday, we would make pizzas. Thursday, who knows what else. But then on Friday, we would become stagehands, um, unload trucks, set up a show. Um, and if we were lucky, we would be spot operators during the show. If we weren't lucky, we'd be selling Cokes in the concession stand. Yeah. That was just how it worked. Yeah, yeah. As soon as the show was over, again, if you were lucky, uh, you would be tearing down the show as a stagehand, loading trucks as a truck driver. If you were unlucky, you would grab a mop bucket and we would literally sweep every row and then mop every row and be done by 5, 6 a.m. Wow. Yeah. We we're going back to talking about all the people behind the scenes. People well, have no idea. That's true. Um, no one really has an idea of all the support staff that go into making any concert run. Right. Uh, you know, uh, if you pull into a an arena with a show, uh, arguably you're going to have two opening acts. You may have ten buses worth of people. Yeah. Uh, well, if you've got thirteen people on a bus, that's 130 people. But you're not looking at the stagehands that are waiting on you when you show up. Locals. The locals, yeah. right. Um, you're not looking at the people like me that are up there popping the popcorn. Uh, there's the other people that are getting ready to tear the tickets, the other people that are going to be doing security or parking. Yeah. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of yeah. people that simply will not have a job if that show isn't coming into the room. So Kenny Rogers uh, was a bandit client. Okay. That, that was my first tour, uh, okay. the 1980 Kenny Rogers Lady Tour. Okay, but let's go back to Freedom Hall though. Isn't that where you met up with some of the first met up with uh, the bandit folks and ended up in one of their photos? <laughs> yeah. Um, let me start by saying I'm from Kingsport. Kingsport at that time had 35 to 40,000 people in it. Yeah. In my neighborhood, uh, the Schaefermans lived, which was my best friend Kent. He had two brothers named Eric and Kyle. All three of those brothers ended up going to work for Bandit. Okay. 
Uh, Michael Strickland and Steve Strickland live two blocks away from me. Yeah. Uh, but you know, back when you're in high school, yeah. you're not cool if you hang out with younger kids. So Michael had no interest or use in, in us. Sure. Um, but when Michael first started touring, he needed, uh, he needed just young help. You know, back in the day, that was just, sure. you know, how long you could stay up and how much you could do is, is, is what got you the job. So he hired uh, the Schaeferman brothers. Uh, he hired his, his younger brother, Steve, and they became the Kenny Rogers Tour, uh, the lighting crew. crew yeah. and, and Michael was not only lighting director for Kenny, but he also was the production manager for Kenny. So Johnson City being 10 miles from where he grew up, he was very proud when his tour, Kenny Rogers, came to Johnson City. And he wanted a company photo. So he made, or he assembled his entire Bandit Light staff in front of a uh, Kenny Rogers semi. Right. And my best friend Kent, being one of the Bandit employees, said, Golden, come over here and get in the picture. And I said, no, I, I'm a, I, you know, I, he said, come on, get in here. <laughs> so he drug me in to the far side of this picture. Michael was at one end of it, I'm at the other. He and has as, no and, idea this is happening. As the story goes, when the film got developed, the first thing he said was, who the hell is that guy? Because that was supposed to be his company right. photo. company photo. And ironically, six months later, the I, I, I was hired, the... but uh, um, <laughs> I, I had to push to get hired. I'll put it that way. Okay. Wow. Michael was nervous that too many high school buddies now working together would just be trouble. Yeah. It was kind of cool that you, all those uh, guys growing up together ended up working like that and put, mm -hmm. putting that company together. It is. It is. Um, I wanted to also talk about uh, your uh, LDing. So your you, so your your road experience before you went to running the office. Alabama, Debbie Boone, Crystal Gale. Did you say Billy Ocean? Billy Ocean. Yep. Okay. So tell me about that. On Kenny Rogers, I was actually hired to simply build stage. Kenny was in the round. Yeah, it was yeah. it was just a simple forty by forty square of winger staging, yeah, which yeah. I had been doing at Freedom Hall, so it was yeah. a no brainer. Yeah. But when Kenny Rogers was over, um, Bandit Lights had two accounts. One was Blackfoot, rock band. Yeah. And this other band called Alabama. Yeah. And uh, when Ke when Kenny was over, I was literally just kind of told no more work don't yeah. have any for you yeah but i did call bandit yeah. and and ask if uh there was any work and they said well we've got blackfoot going out but everybody in the company wants to do it uh we do have this thing called alabama nobody knows what it is if you <laughs> want it you can have it yeah and uh i mentioned that to my girlfriend at the time who's now my wife and uh, she went oh my gosh alabama's going to be huge now this was in 80. I mean, wow. and Alabama was not huge then. Yeah. Um, but she pretty much persuaded me to follow my dream. So I said, I'll, I'll take the Alabama job. Um, started out myself and another fella in a straight truck, uh, following the band around America. Uh, one of us would drive while the other would just kind of sort of curl up in the floor of the passenger seat. You, yeah. You've been there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we did that for a year. Second year we were out, um, the production manager was in a fellow named Brent Barrett, who was also LD, and we were playing Ionia, Michigan. And um, because he was production manager, he asked me to call the focus for him as crew chief. And during that, my uh, uh, one of the bandit guys up on the truss that was focusing um, touched the roof, it, it was electrified, he passed out, he fell. Uh. And I say all that because the production manager slash LD had to suddenly put on his production manager life-saving hat yeah. and get this guy to the hospital, yeah. notify family. I mean, it was yeah. very serious. Yeah. And in the process, he said, Mike, it looks like you're going to have to run the show tonight. And so that's basically how I got my LD job at with Alabama yeah. was by default. Yeah. Um, but it stuck. But then you kept it. I say I kept it. Um, had had the time of my life, um, and and you know, but even and I would say this to anybody that is aspiring to be in our business. Um, I did run the opening acts for Alabama prior to being their LD. Yeah. 
and I did it happily. Uh, I wanted to because my thought process was if I'm going to work all day long putting this stuff up, yeah. I at least want to play with it for a while. Right. And uh, here I go with my little uh, uh, business pitch. Too many people today feel that if they're not paid, then why do it? Well, I, I'm here to tell you there there is a reward for those that do things, you know, for all the right reasons. Right. Uh, I get very frustrated when I hear about somebody that wants to get paid to do an opening act. It's yeah. like that opening act could be, yeah, very well could be yeah. your meal ticket for the next ten years. Exactly. Well, there's a lot of experience to be gained running those sh shows for those opening acts too, there and, is. and you build those relationships too. And so whenever they take off, there you are. Yes. You know. Uh, so, uh, so Billy Ocean, that was a big. Was that the big like first world tour that you went on? Um, no, Paul Young would have been the first world tour I was on, but I was not the LD on Paul Young. Mm -hmm. I was just a, a very happy tech. Yeah. Uh, but on Billy Ocean, he had done one world tour with me as the crew chief. They uh, opted to change out LDs for the second world tour. They gave me the nod because, again, I had run the opening acts. They saw that I could, I could do the job. And they even allowed me to submit a design, um, which Michael, again, put me in a room and said, just design what do you it. think, yeah. do three designs. I'm going to fly you to New York to meet with the management, uh, present all three, yeah. and let's see where it goes. Yeah. Um, and again, with Michael's uh, prompting and his uh, encouragement, yeah. I did. I, I mean, I, I just sat down at the drawing table and right. drew, a, drew up three designs, went up and said, if you take any one of these three, you take me as the designer yeah, or, yeah. or as the LD. Yeah. And all of this, we're still, you're still operating out of Knoxville at this point. That is correct. Yeah. yeah. So when did, uh, when did uh, the uh, Nashville office open and what did that comprise of? Because I know it was pretty small. The Nashville office opened while I was still on the road in about 86 or 87. The first fella to run the Nashville office was a guy named Dixie Fuller, who ironically used to be the stage manager for Alabama. Okay. It seems like everything goes back to <laughs> yeah, Alabama. <exactly. laughs> um, and Dixie, he's still a very good friend of mine, but uh, back in those days, I don't know that he was prepared to actually become an office manager right. And, right. And, and an arm of Bandit. Um, Ironically, in 89, I had finished a Billy Ocean tour worldwide and walked into Michael's office basically first day back and retired. Um, it shocked him, but I told him that I had never, ever had as much fun as I had on Billy Ocean, yeah. never would have that much fun again, and I wanted to go out on a high note. Yeah. Um, he, was, he was a little bit shaken. Yeah. But he asked me, you know, well, where are you going to go to college? What are you going to... You, you were going to go to Nashville? Well, I didn't have a plan. Oh, okay. I, I did say, though, I hope to go uh, learn an office trade so that someday I can come back and possibly run an office desk for you. And he said, well, there's not a college that's going to teach you that. Uh, but until you make up your mind to supplement your income, I have a... Uh, uh, warehouse manager position available in Nashville if you want to move to Nashville and so I agreed uh, warehouse manager sounded like a pretty good position but when I got to Nashville I realized that there were only there was only one person here so uh, <laughs> arguably I could have named myself pretty much anything yeah. other than you know head honcho wow. um, but I, I, I came to Nashville and I augmented my uh, income by also being Crystal Gale's LD. Okay. Uh, Michael once again told me, I can't pay you much to be a, a, a warehouse manager, Yeah. but I know this act, Crystal Gale, that uh, pays well and hardly works. Yeah. I said, okay, well, I'll try that. Um, so I did. I was in the office Monday through Thursday and with Crystal Gale on weekends. Um, and the whole thing just sort of came to a point, I think, in, uh, oh, one of those in the rounds up in the northeast. Yeah. Couldn't tell you which yeah. one. But I was sitting on a bus very much like this all by myself, and out of nowhere, my brain said, I'm done. I don't want to be on this bus anymore. Yeah. 
So I went home, retired from Crystal Gale. Um, the, the general manager of Nashville Bandit was let go because he made some mistakes. And I just basically to found, go, found myself to the go only go. guy with the key. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you showed up to work and nobody else was there. That was basically it, oh yeah. Oh my God. Uh, that, and, and so that was, when, when you came to Nashville and started working as a warehouse manager, that was what year? Do you that know? would be the uh, uh, spring of 1990. At some point, the Nashville office had to surpass the Knoxville office in terms of probably inventory and clients and everything else. Correct. When, 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 you, when did that sort of happen? Was that mid-90s, I think? Um, it, it was a little faster than that, but not to, it wasn't due to anything I did, uh, mm -hmm. but in 91, Right. Um, I was approached by a friend I had met down here named Robert Fry about an artist named Garth Brooks. I don't know that he had ever headlined a show, but, but Robert called me and said, I've got this act. I need two trusses and an LD. Um, so we started working with Garth and he just exploded yeah. within months. Well, But at the same time, you had acts like Brooks and Dunn that just uh, blew up. Yeah. Brooks and Dunn, Alan Jackson, uh, um, Randy Travis. We didn't do Randy, but we did Tim McGraw. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was just this slew of artists that just suddenly were coming to our doorstep. Now, back in that day, there was really only about four lighting companies in the city. Well, I was going to ask you about that. Who was the? Who were the other companies here in town that were basically competitors and that sort of thing? When I moved here in '90, my biggest competitor was a company called Electric Ear out of Lubbock, Texas. Um, I barely remember that name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they were sort of entrenched here. There was another company called Roadworks. Um, there was a, a fella that's still in business here, a, a wonderful man named Jim Bradfield, Bradfield Stage Lighting. Yep. Um, but really, in 1990, that was yeah. the state of country. Right. Uh, uh, production. Yeah. I mean, those companies were handling the country market. Right. We in turn bought a company called Lights Up, which was an, just another one of those, yeah. you know, electric gear type of companies. Uh, and when we bought Lights Up, they had Ronnie Millsap and the Judds as clients. Took over those. So yeah. we took over those accounts and just grew it from there. And uh, a lot of these acts, increasing the production size, increasing the uh, the production quality and that sort of thing, I think, spurred a lot of the growth in all the production companies and the addition of all the new company, newer companies that are here now. Yes. Uh, that uh, were you having to, uh, besides taking over uh, some of these other companies, were you having to? And I, don't, I would imagine you still do sometimes have to uh, move around a lot of inventory from Knoxville and things like that to to support these tours. Back in my first days of, of running Nashville, we were the redheaded stepchild. And Knoxville was by, yeah. by right yeah. the, the main headquarters. So therefore, we, did, we had to follow the rules they created and, and the procedures they created, which again, I totally respect. But back in my initial days, um, I literally had to count how many light bulbs I needed. Um, I needed to count how many cables a, a, a rig would need yeah. and have it shipped down because they weren't going to let me just have a stock of gear. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Was, it literally was yeah. by you know, requisition yeah. only. Right. Bandit has, uh, which I just got to view, an incredible rehearsal space with quite a bit of gear. Um, uh, tell me about that so that other people can know about that. I mean, I think uh, there's, it's one of the high quality rooms that you can rehearse in, but also stream from or mm -hmm. everything else. Sure. Um, when I moved down here in 90, we were in this very small rental spot uh, in, in South Nashville called Space Park South. Uh, probably a three to 4,000 square foot space. Again, just enough to have warehouse a couple of shows. But uh, as, we, as we started landing clients, uh, again, Brooks and Dunn, Alan Jackson, Tim McGraw, Garth Brooks, and forgive me, there's others, 
But all of those came together within a period of like three years, four years. And so in 94, Michael called me up and he said, we, we need to find a bigger space. And so he sent me on a mission throughout Nashville to look for warehouse space. And yeah. boy, did I see some places. Uh, um, and none of them necessarily suited what we really needed. Yeah. Meanwhile, I, I kept watching all of these country acts suffer because back in that day, the mentality was, okay, we're gonna book a municipal for a day to rehearse. Well, Moving Lights had just come along and, and LDs were just starting to wrap their heads around it, but they weren't lightning fast with their programming. And I would watch show after show go out the door and LD after LD burn themselves for 48 straight hours trying to program, program a show while the band's up there making racket or, yeah. or missing dinner break. I mean, yeah. LDs were killing themselves. Yeah. So I approached Michael and I said, let's think about this. Let's think about a smaller space, but one that we could offer free programming time to any LD prior to the show going on the road. I said, if we do that, we're going to gain a lot of friends because LDs, they, yeah. they, they know that how important that is. Um, and a structure that will support a lighting rig. And, correct. So from there, Michael decided, let's go down that, that path. Um, there's a fella named Dizzy Gosnell that works for Bandit who is one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. He's, he's just so talented in so many different ways. But Dizzy and Michael and I decided we would design our own building. And if you look at this building that uh, I'm discussing, it looks like a theater. It's got a 20-foot roof that goes through two-thirds of it, and suddenly that roof juts up to 35 feet. Um, we, we designed it from our background of knowing what venues were like and, and knowing what was needed, what wasn't. Um, we found a builder that was uh, willing to work with us. I mean, you know, most builders will design it and show you what they're going to do. Yeah. We actually designed our building down to where we wanted the phone taps to be. Yeah. Uh, we even put a furniture in each office to know how yeah. we were going to do all of this stuff. But um, we ended up building that building for a, a wonderful sum of money. Um, and to me, it's been one of our most valuable assets yeah, uh, yeah. to this very day, I would say. Yeah. It's nice to have that. It's nice to have that and give the LDs the time. You can hang everything up, test it out, everything else before you go to the venues. You don't have to battle. Well, it, it, great little side story. The very first show we put into this building back in 80 or 96 was Dan Fogelberg. And we hung the rig. The LD came in, programmed. Everything was wonderful. We put it in the truck. It rolled to, to California. We were all high-fiving each other. I got a phone call at load-in. Where's our block and fall? Shows how long ago it was. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? Where's the block and fall for the cable pick? And I said, well, it, it should have been in the truck. Didn't you use it in, in venue yeah. one? Yeah. And they went, no, there wasn't a reason. Well, that yeah. was when it, the new edict came out. That is venue one. Therefore, yeah. we're putting the show up as if we're in yeah. Bridgestone or Municipal. Yeah. There are no shortcuts. There's, yeah. there's no anything. Right. Everything. Now, what that is translated into is when our shows leave Bandit Lights, they've already been through the ringer. Yeah. If, if there's a bad bulb, if there's a bad cable, if there's a bad anything, yeah. we've already weeded it out because we've, we've seen it. Let's go back a little bit here now because um, I'm still one of those guys that loves a tour bus. That's why, that's why we're doing it this way. I know you had enough of that, but what, what was your, what was your, uh, when, when you enjoyed it, how was your experience with tour buses? <laughs> it was home. Yeah. I, and I know you know this, yeah. but when you, you know, back in the day, you would do three month tours. Those are getting to be a little bit less common, yeah. but anybody that has done a, 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 a duration on a bus knows when you go home, it's hard to go to sleep. Absolutely. It really is. Yeah. You, you need that vibration. Yeah. You, you miss that noise. Oh, I love and, it. Um, buses uh, always were my home yeah. up until that moment. I just, 
couldn't do it again. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Uh, well, for me, uh, just in this, you know, pandemic and everything else, it just made it, you know, it was in such a routine, heading out, back and forth, back and forth, mm-hmm. and staying out and that sort of thing. And so uh, this is the longest I think a lot of people have been home, like myself. Mm-hmm. And so just missed it so much, I thought I would try to figure out a way to get back on one. Oh, it feels good and comfortable. <laughs> well, see, yeah, it's always good to come back to it. Sure. So, uh, let's, a little more of your personal stuff here. I understand you're uh, a little bit of an athlete, or were a little bit of an athlete. Do some running? I did. I, I don't know where you got that, but... Uh, <laughs> um, There's lots of, lots of tales out there. Back in... Uh, back when I was with Alabama, I... No. When I was, yeah, when I was with Alabama, I decided to start jogging uh, between setup and dinner. Yeah. And I would always just put my laminate. I, I wasn't a jogger. I mean, I was a little overweight. I wasn't. Yeah. But uh, I decided just to get away and to listen to the music and try and come up with ideas. Uh, I would wear a Walkman. I would always wear my laminate under my shirt because if yeah. I was going to kill over, I wanted somebody to figure out who this body is. <laughs> Um, but it started pretty innocently with me just wanting to get away for 20, 30 minutes a day. But it became an addiction. Uh, I must say a serious addiction to a point where I wanted to run every single day. Wow. And uh, so I started keeping records of where I went or where I would run and how long I would run every day. And over time, I realized I've been to 48 states. I've jogged in 48 states, which I thought was one of the coolest things I could do. Um, And then that magic moment came with Billy Ocean where uh, we we played Anchorage. Well, you know what the first thing I did when I got off the plane? Oh, wow. uh, Went jogging. Yeah. I'm now at 49. There you go. Um, The year after I got married, my wife and I went to Hawaii for a, a belated honeymoon. And once again, even though I wasn't on the road, I'm going to count it. Yeah, sure. I, I hit all 50 states. There you go. And, and that's one thing I would say I kind of feel is an accomplishment. Oh. There's not a lot of people that can say they've done that. No, absolutely. And then, okay, so then what about, uh, what about golf? Now, going back to Alice Cooper, I understand you all worked out a deal with Alice Cooper to go golfing. <laughs> yeah, the, the story there, again, is, is wonderful. Um, I had been working with Alice for about five, six years. And the tour manager, Toby Mammoth, he calls me up and he says, Mike, we're going out again this year. Um, we want the very same package as last year, but we're playing smaller venues and I, I need a little bit of a price break. And I said, okay, Toby, let me, uh, let me, let me work on this. Yeah, yeah. So I called up Michael Strickland. Now he's a huge Alice Cooper fan as well, huge. Yeah. So I called him up and I said, Michael, I got some great news for you. And he said, what's that? And I said, man, Alice, Alice wants a price break. And he went, wow, that's ridiculous. You know, he yeah. went he went into the typical owner yeah. rant of, yeah, yeah. he's got more money than I do. He doesn't need it. <laughs> and I stopped him. I said, no, 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 wait, stop. Have you ever wanted to play golf with Alice Cooper? Yeah. And he said, yeah. And I said, then this is easy. Because yeah. it was like a four, $400 a week break. Yeah, that's yeah, what, yeah. You know, I yeah. said, then this is easy. Yeah. I'll put it in the contract. We'll give you this break, but you have to give us one game of golf with Alice every year. Wow. And Michael said, you think you'll go for it? And I said, well, it's a negotiation, isn't it? Sure. And so I did. They agreed. I even put it up. I built a special contract where purchaser shall provide golf balls and, you know, a client shall provide golf carts, so <laughs> forth and so on. But uh, wow. Toby Mammoth made sure that from that point forward, every year, if Alice came anywhere in this vicinity, yeah. he would call us and say, okay, you want to go to Valhalla up in Louisville next, next Sunday? Um, one year, he actually said, look, uh, West Palm is, is the closest we're getting. If you want to fly down here, you can. Yeah. We passed on that one. But no, I've, I've played golf with Alice here in town five or six times now. It's, it's been a blast. It's just been a blast. And is it still happening? I mean, is it con- does it continue? Uh, it, well, it is, and it's, I mean, yes, it is, but... When, when, when you can make it happen. When, we, when you can make it happen, right. Um, Alice has a very fascinating schedule in that he plays every single day. But, but, but there are times where he might actually go to the next city to play twice due to weather. 
Uh, so yeah. yeah, and if he's got, you know, he a lot of times this has to uh, be on like a day off, but uh, right. we've played quite a few times. And I understand he has some uh, he, names for your uh, efforts on the golf course. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Shankopotamus comes to mind, but I believe one of one of his favorites was Bassmaster because we, we, we did play a course with a lot of water on it, and <laughs> I, I ended up in the middle of many lakes. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Well, that's got to be fun, though. He, Alice is a wonderful fella, uh, plays great golf, uh, has the most incredible temperament, um, and is a, a, just an extremely yeah. congenial fella. I mean, he, yeah. he, 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 you can't rattle him, well, and he can't get upset. Right. Well, what a full circle for you, though, being one of the, the, the for your first concert. Well, and now you're playing golf with him. And, and on that note, um, in 1977, six, when I first saw that first Alice Cooper concert. I took Michael Strickland's younger brother, yeah. Steve, yeah. and another fellow named Kent Schaeferman, who, who was my best friend. When we got the Alice Cooper concert uh, tour going, they needed an LD. And I called up my buddy Kent, who was actually out on WWE at the time, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'll do WWE. And I said, you want to go do Alice? He said, what? You want to go be the LD for Alice Cooper? And uh, it took 30 years for that to take place, but but my friend Kent Schaeferman ended up being yeah. the LD awesome. for that tour that I, I saw that first show with yeah. 30 years prior. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. I'm proud of that one. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, is there anything that I missed about you or Bandit that, that you want to share with your fans? Oh, well, it's been... Uh, it's been an incredible ride. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought you might ask questions of this nature when you first invited yeah. me to do this. And I found myself unable to really remember oh so many things. And, and I bet you you're the same way. Sure. Um, as we get older, our, our brains are just being overwhelmed with the memories, not only of yesteryear, but this year yeah, yeah. and this month and this week. And, uh, you know, I, I think about the 40 years of ups and downs i wouldn't trade a single bit of it yeah uh my best friends are with this company yeah. and uh you know as i'm gr growing older i'm starting to realize that someday i got to turn it over to somebody else and i just i don't want to go there i don't want to even think about it yeah. because it's it's been yeah. it's been my life well and you you still enjoy it i do still enjoy it um i love the challenges it, I love the competition, um, and as much as anything, I love the relationships that I've made, not only within the company, but outside the company. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're yeah. one of those, yeah, uh, you know, Same here. When, when, when you came to the office just earlier, we were reminiscing about the first time you, sh yeah. you had walked in the door, yeah. which was over 20 years ago, yeah. Yeah. and all the things that have gone on since. Oh, yeah. um, that's one thing that I find very cool. Even old competitors are now some of my best friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a fellow named Scott DeVos, who used to be the guy that ran Obi, yeah. which was my bitter rival back in the mid-90s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now he's a good friend of yeah, mine. Yeah. And, and, and those are the things I think I'm going to miss as much as anything. Yeah. So let's talk about some of your, over the 40 years, I know there's been a lot of adventures. What's the strangest thing you ever took as checked baggage? Uh, I've got two of them. Okay. Uh, back in the 80s, there was this product called heater coil smoke powder. It was a white powder made by Pyropack. And in lieu of smoke machines, you would get a hot plate and put it on a burner and pour this powder on it, and it would just smoke. smoke. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, you couldn't get it in Europe, I don't believe. But I was getting ready to go to Europe to, to do a Paul Young tour. They didn't have any heater coil smoke powder over there. And in the 11th hour, Strickland ran up to me and threw four bottles of this heater coil smoke powder at me and said, just take them as checked baggage. So I flew over to England and went through customs. And of course, they unzipped yeah. my bag. 
here's four big old bottles of white powder that say pyro on them. I and was say uh, today you wouldn't be able to even get through the airport here. No, <laughs> yeah. but the uh, the guy that was checking it, he he just looked at me. He said, "I can you tell me what this is?" And I explained it, and I said, uh, "It's it's for concerts." Yeah. He just kind of said, "Okay, you can go." <laughs> now wow. again, you couldn't do that today. No. But ironically, on yet another Paul Young tour, I was flying out of Knoxville, and the UK office, there was a curved curtain track. They didn't have the two curved bins. We did. And so I took two pieces of curved curtain track, which is like an eight-foot piece of semi-bent metal, to the airport and tried to check those. And they said they couldn't check them unless they were in cardboard. And so they gave me just a boatload of cardboard and a a razor knife. And I sat in the lobby of the Knoxville airport in 1986, hacking up cardboard and taping it around this curtain track. And then when I got into the UK, uh, again, here I go through customs with these. Explaining. Yeah, wheeling this cart with these two eight foot things attached to it and uh once again it was like you don't want to know what this is (laughs) okay just keep moving (laughs) just keep moving yeah get that out of here (laughs) okay uh other adventures if you can tell me uh going to the islands with the billy ocean group Mm. what you did there uh well by the islands i guess you're talking about the last show i did with billy which would have been in trinidad that's that was his uh I guess that's where he was born. He okay. lived in England, yeah. but he, I believe, was born in Trinidad. And so we were staying at this uh, resort in the middle of nowhere. It was just a, a beautiful little lodge, pool, but surrounded by jungle. And uh, I was out by the pool one afternoon, and I heard a commotion, some giggling, some uh, noise. And out of the jungle, here comes Billy Ocean with the... Uh, a kettle kettle drum player right. and they had procured some local substance and uh, Billy to show this fella how the natives did it had taken him into the jungle to pull some banana leaves and even I learned this the, the locals would wrap up their their yeah. substance of yeah. choice in a yeah. banana leaf and pull the stem out and use it to wrap it wow so I actually learned you know how how they do Some it. new skills. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, I also wanted to ask you about uh, our good friend. Uh, we had a heartbreaking loss uh, last year with Steve Gudis. You knew him from way back. I did. And did he come out of Knoxville as well? Because I don't know. I didn't know that about him. I. He may have. Now, it's funny. Everything seems to go back to square one. But when I first started working at Freedom Hall yeah. as a, uh, uh, a city employee, Steve Gudis worked for a, uh, a company called uh, Intam Limited, which was a promotion company, him and Phil Lashinsky. Yeah. Um, now, Steve would be the one, the promoter rep, that would hire the stagehands for, say, a Styx concert. And they would bring the stagehands up from Knoxville, the IA. But Steve recognized that he could hire us. I don't know what loophole he found, but he could hire the locals for $5 a truck wow. to load. Wow. And so Steve hired me and a few other uh, you know, Freedom Hall employees uh, to load trucks. If it was a good night, we'd get a, a T-shirt as a bonus. But... Uh, I can honestly say Steve is the first guy that actually got me a job in the industry because it's one thing to say you pop popcorn and maybe run a spotlight, yeah. but it's another to say I'm backstage. Yeah, yeah. And it was because of Steve Gudis. Uh, it was a KISS concert of all things. Uh, I was hired to uh, be a truckloader. Wow. Yeah. And, and it's funny how whatever almost 40 years later we were still yeah still bumping into each other uh, at, at, at venues in the in yeah. town i didn't meet him till the late 90s but uh what an incredible guy and uh heartbreaking loss that we had we yeah had. yeah he's he's a legend he yeah, really is absolutely well michael thanks so much for doing this uh i think we learned a lot i did anyway it's been a lot of fun 
thank you for doing what you do. And um, I hope that about uh, this time next year, we're, we don't have time to do this anymore. You know, I hope so also, yeah. Don, but uh, I admire you for, for this venture. I think oh, it's going to be awesome. Oh, and, I, you know, I, I think our business, our, our community is starved to simply stay yeah. intact. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so I hope that, that this podcast does reach out to a few folks that yeah. makes them sort of remember the good old days and also to uh, have faith in our future. We aren't going anywhere. Yeah. We, we, yeah. We're still at full staff. If we thought this thing was going to last forever, yeah. we would not be doing what we're doing. Yeah. But uh, you know, if, if I can close by saying I, I, I have total faith our community will survive. Um, I just, I just urge everybody to uh, stick together, uh, do what they need to do until we can get back on our feet. But when we do, uh, again, I'll go back to the Spanish flu. When that thing was over, you know what happened? Yeah. The Roaring Twenties. Yeah. And that's expe- That's exactly what I anticipate seeing again. We're yeah. going to have a second Roaring Twenties, yeah. being 2020s. Right. But when this thing is over, man, it's going to yeah. be like 1999. Yeah. Be We're going to party hard. like crazy. Exactly. It's going to be hard to keep up. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Michael Golden, Vice President of Bandit Lights. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a thumbs up and we welcome your comments. Check out more of the Road Dog Project here on YouTube and follow on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Come on, Leon.